So our, our last speaker of the session is Harold Pollack, who I think is really one of the gems of the University of Chicago. Uh, Har Harold is the Helen Ross professor at the School of Social Service Administration and uh, co-director of the Crime Lab here. And I, I think actually one of the themes of uh, the, the panel for me introducing my, my fellow speakers is how so many of my colleagues are, are, are Paul Thomer-like. Uh, Harold has this uh, ability to combine like, the understanding of the individual with the policy ramifications. Uh, and uh, besides being like a uh, an amazing traditional academic, he is an amazing communicator that uh, I think if you want to learn how to write an op-ed or a blog piece, just Google Harold. Uh, really some of the most amazing pieces I I've seen in terms of the ability to, to capture the essence of an issue uh, using common sense and uh, the, uh, the, the understanding of the individuals involved and to be able to communicate it in a way that anyone can get it in, in a very interesting, lively writing style. Uh, so, and it's also a very thoughtful speaker. So we have the big expectations of you in this, this uh, talk here, Harold, on uh, Medicaid as the unlikely future uh, by partisan health policy. Um, thanks, Marshall, for that setup, uh, I think. There, uh, I hope I, I, uh, I live up. By the way, as he's saying that, I'm dropping the battery out of the clicker, just so that. Uh, uh, so I've already failed. There, um, uh, I, I want to talk today, in, in some ways the, the talk today describes how Medicaid imperfectly and in an unlikely way is emerging as a vehicle to deal with a lot of the issues that have come up earlier today. And I should say that I'm, I'm uh, I'll start by mentioning some of the work that I do at the University of Chicago Crime Lab and the University of Chicago Health Lab. Uh, I co-direct both. I'm really, I'm the Joe Biden of both efforts. Uh, the, um, uh, that's me actually at the podium. The, um, uh, and I should say Barack Obama is sitting over there for the health lab, David Meltzer, and uh, Jens Ludwig is the uh, Barack Obama of the crime lab. And, and uh, the work that we do is to do randomized trials for individuals who are really at the interface of health vulnerability, social vulnerability, often in my case, particularly involving the criminal justice system or addiction. So one of the trials that I'm involved in is something called the West Side Narcotics Diversion Initiative, in which nonviolent drug dealers and drug buyers are, uh, instead of being arrested formally, they are uh, sent to addiction treatment to see if we can improve outcomes for those people. Uh, a major effort that, uh, that David's the PI on, uh, the Supportive Release Center, uh, is designed to prevent homelessness and other adverse outcomes among detainees who leave the Cook County Jail. And the challenge there is that there's this moment of maximum vulnerability that occurs just when people are passing between administrative systems and they're the most likely to slip through our fingers and have some, some really horrible outcome uh, when no one is really uh, uh, in charge of their fate and, or paying attention. And then another uh, project I should mention is something called the 911 project where we're, we're trying to uh, improve uh, Chicago's uh, response to uh, people in behavioral crisis who encounter police, uh, people with severe mental illness, people with addiction, people with intellectual and developmental disabilities, uh, uh, such as in the Laquan McDonald case. Uh, here's uh, just the Supportive Relief Center is, is um, I'm also, by the way, a photography nut, but uh, uh, th this is a set of trailers that our team has put up just off of the grounds of uh, the Cook County Jail, and, and, the, and the staff of TASC and, and Heartland Health Outreach are trying to assist uh, individuals leaving the jail, as I just described. And the thing that is really important about, about these uh, uh, efforts that relates to today's theme is that five years ago, it would be very difficult to do every one of the things that I just described for one simple reason, which is that almost everybody was uninsured. So five years ago, the great, great majority of detainees who left the Cook County Jail had no health coverage. Uh, today, about 80% of them are insured, and almost always through Medicaid. Not, all, not entirely, but almost always. And, and, uh, and what's striking is there is a tremendous amount of uh, bipartisan support for those kinds of efforts. Actually, in some of the research that I do that's not in the urban lab, we actually deal quite a bit with uh, addiction treatment providers and policymakers around the country who are concerned about the opioid epidemic. 
And it's really amazing. You know, many of, many of my progressive students think of the Republican Party in, uh, as exemplified by the unworthiness of the Trump administration. And that's just not what it's like when you call up someone in Ohio and you say, what are you doing about the opioid epidemic? And they say, well, we're trying to get the uh, Medicaid regs to match the American Society for Addiction Medicine criteria for residential treatment. And, they, and you talk about the work. And you say to the person, well, what about all this politics in Washington? And they say, well, our governor has told us not to worry about that, that our job is to figure out how to deal with the opioid epidemic. And in, in a really striking and admirable way, when, when ACA was passed and when addiction and mental health parity was passed, a lot of us worried that we were creating the Willie Horton vulnerability in health reform. You know, anybody who studied uh, health policy knew that one of the key populations that was going to be insured in large numbers were adults involved in the criminal justice system. And one of the interesting things is that has just never happened that all around the country, Republican policymakers, uh, politicians, are trying to make Medicaid work for this population, not uh, trying to use that as a political weapon to undermine uh, uh, health reform. These are people, by the way, who oppose the ACA and who are certainly not, you know, not Harold Pollack ideological allies on things, but they're trying to figure out a way to help people in very difficult circumstances. Uh, they're, um, uh, and it's a really striking thing that points to the unlikely political trajectory that we're on and the tools that are likely to be effective to reduce disparities that are kind of at that interface of politics and policy where you need to operate to help people. So, you know, the Medicaid expansion has really been entrenched. It's helping millions of people. Albert gave you some statistics. I'll give you more. And it's reduced medical debt, it's improved mental health in various ways, it's subsidized the ecosystem of safety net care, many, many problems with it. But it is the platform at this point that we have. And one of the striking things is that many, many uh, state and local officials around the country in both parties uh, have embraced it. And uh, uh, now, and, and um, interestingly enough by that, it has not happened with the ACA marketplaces around the country. The same people that we talk to who will talk in great depth and sophistication about how Medicaid is, how, what they're trying to do for addiction treatment. We say, what about addiction parity in your, in your exchange, in your state? And they say, why are you asking me about that? There's one politician in America who owns those exchanges. Anybody know who that person is? His name is Barack Obama, and he's not in office anymore. And none of the officials that we talk to are particularly knowledgeable or invested in making those exchanges work to deal with disparities in the way that, that, that most of us would like to see. So, uh, uh, and those marketplaces are not working real well. Uh, and in particular, they work, they work actually pretty well for people with incomes below about 200% of the federal poverty line. By communication tip, don't say FPL when you're talking to actual human beings because no one knows what you're talking about. <laughs> but that's the federal poverty line. And, and people have high premiums and high out-of-pocket payments very often if you're talking to just working class people, middle class people. And particularly in rural areas, these exchanges are not working real well. Uh, they don't particularly control costs, and so and that's one reason premiums are high. And one of the striking things is that a lot of non-poor people are very resentful of that. So Sarah Cliff went to Kentucky, which as far as I can tell, Sarah Cliff's a reporter for Vox. And as far as I can tell, that Kentucky voted unanimously for President Trump in the 2016 election. And one of the striking things with a lot of the people that she talked to said, you know, I'm in this exchange and I've got all these, it's better than if I didn't have insurance. But I'm, but, my, but I'm working really hard at my job, and if I go to the emergency room, I'm going to get a bill for $700, and my screw-up cousin, who shouldn't even be on Medicaid in the first, he can go to the emergency room for free. And, you know, and he doesn't deserve that. And, and, uh, and, and, that's, and that, you know, in the short term, of course, that leads to, uh, you know, that makes ACA more difficult to sustain politically. But in the long run, think about what that's headed for in terms of the politics of American health insurance, that basically people prefer Medicaid to private insurance in a lot of ways. And if you look at polling, majorities prefer Medicaid. Uh, I won't go into too much detail, but it's striking how many Americans value Medicaid. Uh, by the way, I'll, let me say that this is, I'll just say something about some of the progress in ACA. I, what I love about this, 
My audience always laughs at this picture, the Democrats and the Republicans for opposite reasons. The Republicans assume this is a joke. You know, I'm sort of t teasing President Obama. The, the, my Democratic students think this is just a real picture. And, uh, <laughs> you know, they're like, they're like, he screwed up the flash. You know, what happened to the rest of President Obama's body there? They're, um, so, um, you know, if you look at the percentage, yeah, Albert's already given you some of that. The, uh, the percentage of the population who are covered is, has you know, increased dramatically. There's sometimes a debate about whether ACA actually improved insurance coverage. I think that's kind of a stupid debate. If you just look at the picture, it obviously did. And, um, and Medicaid is really doing most of the heavy lifting in that, at least in the states that embrace it. And one of the striking things is there's a lot of bipartisan work on Medicaid. Uh, it happened in the states that expanded Medicaid. It actually happened in the states that didn't expand Medicaid also if you look at issues that are not on the front page, that are not politically polarized. The same states that wouldn't expand Medicaid, they were working with the Obama administration about disability, about quality improvement, about all sorts of Medicaid initiatives. They needed the federal money and they had populations and rural hospitals places that, that they really needed to, uh, to work with. And there's a lot of constructive, difficult bargaining that occurred and a sense of ownership on both sides of what, was, of what resulted. Uh, so here, if you look at just trends in uninsurance, obviously it was, uh, the uninsured went down a lot more in the Medicaid expansion states. There's lots of ways to show that. Uh, there's been a decline in bankruptcies and medical bills and Medicaid is, is really the key, the key lever there. Uh, about 9.4 million fewer families have problems paying medical bills. And if you look at the health impact of Medicaid since ACA, th the most readily documented thing is just improved mental health, reduced stress, basically because people have financial security. That's the first thing that you're going to, and the most, the most solidly documented health impact right away. Uh, we also see, by the way, supporting the infrastructure of care. Now, this matters a lot. This is, these are just four health systems that found in, the, in one year their uncompensated care went down by about a third in most of these places. That matters for these patients, but it also matters for all the other patients. And you know, Medicaid has an ecosystem impact that's different from its impact on individual patients. Uh, now, if you look at the impact on disparities of Medicaid, and I'm happy to talk more in the questions, uh, there's good evidence for some things, there's weak evidence for others, and there's no evidence for still others. There's good evidence about mental health. People self-assessed mental health status. It goes up very quickly. The Oregon Health Insurance Experiment is probably the best place to see that. Uh, you often see people saying, well, Medicaid doesn't improve people's health, it just improved their mental health. <laughs> it sort of reminds me of the statement of this guy running for Senate in Alabama who said that, he, he, he says we shouldn't have any Muslims in the Senate because they don't believe in religious freedom. And it's like the self-reputing <laughs> statement there. Um, so um, uh, there's good evidence about financial well-being. Uh, and also that, and I think Albert's diabetes uh, uh, medicine graph starts to show that there's good evidence that there's, that there's improved chronic disease diagnosis and management. And I don't think we've seen that yet in clinical endpoints, but there is pretty good reason to think that that's happening. Uh, and there's also evidence that Medicaid improves outcomes for discrete populations. Uh, there was a New York Times story about gunshot wound victims in Chicago and Detroit. Before ACA, there were people walking around Chicago in significant numbers who had helmets because they couldn't find surgeons to close their skull if they had a head wound. And there were people with, uh, who were with, uh, uh, you know, they, they, had, they had a colostomy bag because they couldn't find surgeons who would close up their abdominal wounds. They all got treated in the emergency room when they got shot. But all the post-acute care, a lot of people just didn't get it. And that is not happening now in the same way. Uh, there is suggestive but non-definitive evidence that Medicaid reduces mortality. The, a lot of critics of Medicaid have made this the standard by which we should evaluate Medicaid, which I think given that mortality is such a rare outcome that arises from such multiple causes, that's not the right way to think about the problem. But there's some suggestive evidence, particularly when it coincided, when Medicaid expanded, for example, around the time that that the heart drugs came out. You could see real differences in HIV mortality that were related to Medicaid eligibility because people could get a powerful treatment. I think there's very little evidence that Medicaid improves health behaviors and deals with the social determinants the way that it needs to. There's a lot of people trying to do that. 
Uh, but but uh, we have a lot of work to do before Medicaid is an effective platform for public health. Uh, let me say why, I, well, another reason why I think Medicaid is the future of uh, bipartisan health policy. You know, a lot of Americans say our health policy is broken, which it definitely is in a lot of ways. It's broken because of our broken health politics. That's really one of the fundamental problems that we have. You know, in principle, we could have an ideologically moderate system that looks a lot like the ACA marketplaces, like they do in Switzerland or the Netherlands, that works very well to give universal coverage. Uh, the problem is that, the, that this kind of a, an approach, it's, in, it's ideologically moderate, but it's institutionally radical. It's, they're complex and fragile things that have to be stood up. They require bipartisan, pragmatic problem solving, and that's precisely what our political system cannot deliver. Uh, it could deliver that Medicare Advantage. It cannot deliver that for low-income populations affected by Medicaid. So even though there's very good arguments that we could have a good health system that's market-driven, that promotes universal coverage, that's just not what we're going to get. Now, by the way, a lot of progressives say, well, that's why I like single payer, because that's going to cut through all of this. The problem is that that, that presents single payer as the alternative to our screwed up politics, whereas, in fact, if you think about it, the single payer system would have to be the product of that same screwed up politics. You know, it, it, we would have to deal with all of the reasons why our current political system is messed up in health policy. That's the, that's, we'd have to compromise on all of these issues to pass single payer. It doesn't emerge from the head of Zeus as a functioning, you know, the French system is not going to pop up. You know, comparing the French system to the U.S. system and saying the French system is better, that's just not actionable. How do you get from here to there? Uh, and so, you know, there's, for, just to give one example, a very disciplined single-payer system that substantially reduced health expenditures would require a doubling of the federal income tax or an equivalent increase in federal tax revenue just to port that stuff onto the federal budget. Uh, and, and there's just a bunch of things that are really, really a huge lift for American politics. And then there's also the question of what do you do with the existing infrastructure of state Medicaid programs? So, you know, we've had 50 years of disability programs. Does anybody know what the Sanders single-payer plan does with Medicaid services like home and community-based services? L leaves them as a separate system completely brackets that, which I think was a wise decision, but it basically was a very interesting acknowledgement. We don't know how to rewire this. And also, we need these governors. So, um, uh, so I'll, I'll stop in, a, uh, just to close out, I will say the next go-round, where it's a little bit like 2006 right now for a lot of Democrats. They're, they're looking at results like last night or two nights ago in Virginia, saying, we're going to win some elections soon. What do we do? I think that what we're going to see is something that is simpler, even if it's more ideologically radical. And it'll have some strange bedfellows when Democrats try to expand Medicaid and when states try to expand Medicaid. Because a lot of state officials, whatever their ideological perspectives around the country, they say, you know, I can deal with disparity issues by, through my Medicaid program. I have constituencies that, that value that. And so I, I think the bipartisan challenge we're going to have is to a, find a dignified political way to do this, but B, to make Medicaid genuinely work, to deal with the problems we all acknowledge, like low provider reimbursement, that make Medicaid a much less effective public health tool than it should be. Uh, because I think that that's the future of American health policy, whether we like it or not, and we should embrace it and make it work. So with that, I will, uh, I'll stop and happy to answer questions. Thank you. Hi, Harold. Thanks. Debbie Stelberg from the University of Chicago. Um, a quick comment and a question. I wanted to highlight one area uh, where there's, I think, pretty good evidence of Medicaid's benefit that you didn't have on your list um, that has to do with family planning services. Um, and uh, it's especially threatened in our current era. It's been really cool to practice in a world in which everyone could get any contraception that they wanted and we didn't have to uh, really argue about that, and there's good evidence from before the ACA that states that had family planning waivers, it's not causal, but had an association with lower rates of preterm birth and uh, low birth weight, largely through preventing pregnancies that were both unwanted and would have been high risk for those outcomes had they, could occur, had they occurred. Um, so good, 
good additional point. Um, I appreciate your optimism around the politics of this, but I'm having a hard time understanding, and maybe I, I'm missing some of the nuance of it, how do you explain the um, governors who have rejected Medicaid expansion despite what feels like just a straightforward gift from the federal government that their populations want and would benefit from that they've rejected? How do we get past that ideological? Well, by the way, certainly on family planning, I agree with you, and it's why it's important for, you know, people who have different moral views on abortion and family planning have been very active politically and have won a bunch of elections, and good for them. You know, I think people who think differently uh, and who hold the values that you express, which I also hold, you know, we have to, we, we, we have to get out there and, not just, and, and, and win some state elections. The question of, um, one of the things about Medicaid that's both good and bad is it allows such variation around the country around these issues. Uh, now on the Medicaid, on uh, why states rejected Medicaid, I'll show you two maps. This is a map, this is not quite right because, uh, or, or, you know, well, there's been a little bit of fuzzing. You look at this map and you say, well, a bunch of states have rejected Medicaid and it's sort of the yellow, the, the orange states are the states that rejected Medicaid expansion. You look at this, this map is deceptive because it's weighted by land. You know, there's a lot of cows in Wyoming, but there's not a lot of people. If you actually take the same map, this is going to look like a bad acid trip for those of you that, I just want to warn you. I'm going to take the same map and I'm going to weight it by the population of people affected who are shut out by Medicaid. And this is what it looks like. That Louisiana, by the way, should be blue now. I made this map before. It's a cartogram. 90% of the people shut out of the Medicaid expansion are in the Old South. And it is, it is where the poor people are non-white and it's a red state. And, uh, um, and that's a big challenge. I was actually hoping that President Trump could convince some of these states to expand Medicaid. And basically say, look, you, know, you can do that with me even though you couldn't do that with President Obama. These are going to switch, by the way. I think some of these big states are going to expand Medicaid, but it's going to take time. You know, it took, you know, Arizona 1980. Uh, and, but, you know, we have racial politics in America that, that uh, is a big factor in Medicaid expansion. And that's, uh, I don't know how else to say it. Uh, hi, I'm Nathaniel Meadow over at Loyola Internal Medicine. So I have a clarification question and then an opinion question. So you said that the behavior of those who receive Medicaid didn't change. Does that mean that they also didn't use more resources uh, after obtaining Medicaid? And then the opinion question is, what do you think about kind of what Nevada tried to do by having the buy-in Medicaid option? So let me, let me answer that in reverse order. It was very interesting. Nevada passed a Medicaid buy-in, the Nevada State Legislature. And there was a real question about whether the Republican governor in Nevada would sign this thing. And he eventually, after a delay, vetoed it. But think of how much American politics has moved that a Republican Nevada governor, that we were all waiting to see, was he going to veto a bill that would allow anybody to buy into Medicaid. You know, that shows you how the ground is moving. He did not say, by the way, this is a socialist, you know, wacky thing. He just said, I, this doesn't seem like a very, you know, this law and balance, I'm going to veto it. Uh, it's, well, the ground is shifting. Uh, you know, as far as what's changing in Medicaid, I think that, you know, people who face either complex social determinants or complex behavioral issues like smoking, we would like to see health insurance improve those factors. And there's almost no evidence, if you look at, say, the Oregon health insurance experiment, that we affect people's nutrition, that we affect their smoking. In fact, by giving them more money effectively, we might increase their smoking, because smoking is expensive. And we haven't figured out how to, that, that line between health insurance coverage and health, not just for people on Medicaid, but for everybody, we don't, we, we're not good at helping people be healthier uh, by, by making sure that they're covered. We can make sure they don't lose their house if they get cancer, and that's great. But we're not so good at preventing the cancer by getting them to stop smoking. Hi, I'm Deb Burnett from University of Chicago. Thank you, Harold, for a great talk, and to all the presenters this morning for wonderful talks. Uh, Harold, what do you think is the role, the most practical way for physicians and physician organizations to help bring about this vision you've put out? Well, I think, I think that there's a couple of things. I would say one aspect is advocacy for your patients. 
and to put a human face on issues and to do that with confidence that many, many Americans both really respect what physicians have to say and other healthcare providers have to say. Uh, and, and, uh, uh, and to also speak with integrity about what's not working and things that we could do as an institution if, say, Medicaid worked better. You know, several people today have commented that we do not embrace Medicaid patients at the University of Chicago Medical Center as much as we would like to. You know, I, my wife and I take care of her brother who is intellectually disabled, who's on Medicaid, gets very good care at the University, you know, University of Chicago. We're very grateful for it. We certainly see ways that it is different uh, for him than it is for people with uh, the best insurance that you could get through Blue Cross or whatever. And I think one of the things I'd like to see us do is to be honest, to say to people, for example, to the people in Springfield, here's some things that we would like to do for our patients, but we can't do because you're a bad customer for our hospital. And so that when we talk to our financial people and they say, you know, we share your values, but the university's owed $150 million by the state, and so it's hard for us to be as humane as we would like to be given the financial realities of this. I think that sort of, Integrity, and I, you know, you mentioned, by the way, you know, notice I said something very, um, I, I criticized, I referred to the president as unworthy. That's another aspect of integrity, just to speak plainly and to say, you know, there's people that are litigating basic values that should be the foundation of American health policy, and President Trump is one of those people, and we're just going to, not in a dramatic way, but just say it. Harold, one last question. Um, one of the things that you pointed out is that Medicaid really covered vulnerable populations for substance abuse and behavior health. But the counter argument about markets is that there's no private market that does a good job on, let's say, your a uh, family member who has intellectual disabilities for those who uh, experience uh, adult mental illness or behavioral health issues. And there seems to be a gap between equity in Medicaid for basic covered benefits and non-equity in insurance markets as we know them that should be much broader but aren't taking place. And that's a setup for just having people caught in the middle and exacerbating disparities. Can you comment on that? Well, there's, there's a lot there. Uh, I mean, one, by one of the ironies is the simplicity, the human experience of being a Medicaid recipient is in some ways, in some ways, better than the human experience of being on private insurance. Uh, you know, Vincent, my brother-in-law, has been hospitalized maybe 25 times since, since we've taken responsibility for him. We just never get weird stuff that sort of says, this is not a bill that we're trying to figure out, weird paperwork, <laughs> weird deductibles. Uh, now, we can't take him to every specialist we'd like to take him to because Medicaid doesn't pay enough. But we don't have to deal with a lot of, this, uh, a lot of the stuff that people deal with in private insurance. And I think that... that that is one of the reasons why there's such a groundswell for expanded public coverage is that pe people don't like private insurance and the market does not work very well for that. I would never put him in a managed care product, for example. Uh, there's, um, I, I do think that the de on these disparities, the details matter so much and the people in this room know a lot of the details, know the ways that Medicaid can be designed to facilitate access or it can be designed in a way that, that fails to provide access, and particularly for things like addiction treatment where the populations are so politically marginalized. It's so important for us to explain those details to people in a way that people can understand. All right, Harold, nobody's gonna cover um, the mental health or the behavioral health or the addiction stuff in Illinois because they're all going into Medicaid managed care and that's a done deal and that's another example where we have to mobilize and talk. So one more quick question and a quick response, Harold. 
Notice Marshall did not praise me for my quick responses when he was so <laughs> effusive before, when I started. Hey, go ahead. Hi, uh, Kyle Bergen, DePaul University School.